Lee McCormack, how you doing? Welcome to Faster. Hey, John. How are you, brother? I'm great. Good, good, good. How often do you get called McCormick? Too much. As a matter of fact, <laughs> um, when I was in my late 20s, I wound up getting, like, my team won a Pulitzer Prize, right? I worked yep. at the newspaper business. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm the coolest dude in the world. I'm a freaking badass. And the certificate arrives, and they spelled it ick instead of ack. <laughs> they misspelled my name, dude. Oh, I didn't even get it changed. I was like, I was like, lest you ever think you're cool, keep in mind, right? Keep in mind. Yeah, I've got yeah. one of those last names too. Oh, yeah. yeah, one of those last names too, where people have always, I, I get everything from Thornton to Thornum to oh. Thornham, Thornhorn to you name it. As, 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 but it's never what it is. So Thornum is always. <laughs> it seems simple, but I yeah, know, easy for Yeah, right. Cool, cool. So listen, man, we are on fact, I was on another podcast. Oh, go for it. Yeah, yeah, no, you're on here today because you are sort of the bike handling master. You're the guru. Um, I was looking for somebody to come on the show and after doing a little bit of research, like you're the guy. So I'm super happy to have you here. Uh, welcome to Faster. It's going to be awesome. And you've got a really cool story, um, but I want to hear it from you. So let's hear your story Thanks, brother. and uh, let's go from there. Okay. Um, okay, we'll go. I guess we'll start. Well, okay, you know, I'm a kid, right? Suburban kid, normal stuff. Um, I um, I was a BMXer as a kid, like every kid was in the 70s with my Schwinn Stingray, yep. right? And yep. it's funny, like, I think one of the criminals in the neighborhood was keeping an eye on me because it took me a nickel at a time, years to get it, you know, get the chrome off and put a BMX seat and BMX bars and, you know, butch it out, paint it black. And the the, the day it was finished, someone stole it. <laughs> they were like watching for my project to be done. But I was just a kid, you know, kid rider. And I was always heavy back then. My mom and I had this thing going on with Weight Watchers. And uh, really like, to sum it up, it's like, like like uh like after high school i was working and doing stuff and um at the time i was into motocross right yep. and uh not good at it not not fit not skilled neither but i was having fun with it it was doing what i needed at the time in terms of trying to like prove myself to be tough that's what that was about you know yeah and and um basically i started I, I, after after working on cars and doing construction i decided college was for me after all and and i and i it's funny i bought a Nishiki Pueblo, three hundred and twenty dollar low end mountain bike. The same week I started journalism classes. Same week, right? And I bought that thing, and I was out of shape. I remember I rode that to school the first time. Forty seven minutes, dripping sweat, could barely do it, you know. But then I loved it. It, it just, you know, we all were cyclists. We get it. Like there's just something inherent about riding that is great and especially like getting your body from point a all the way to point b when you usually use my badass chevy nova with a 350 v8 which i built myself you know and you're like you can do these things yourself and it's satisfying and i started riding and I be, it became kind of religion for me right and yeah. and in parallel i'm starting to develop starting to develop my professional skills i'm trying to talk less fast and um it's funny by the end of that first semester, that commute was 12 minutes instead of 47. So like wow. the fitness came on fast, fast, yeah. fast, fast. And, and, I, and I discovered that under all that adipose tissue and the low self-esteem I've been wearing was an athlete. Yeah. It was an athlete. And I, and I know a lot of road riders and endurance people find this. It's like you can get on a bike and pedal. It'll go forward. It'll take you from A to B. It has its various satisfactions. And you start to see muscles, you know what I'm saying? And my personality yeah. started to come out, you know what I mean? And and I just started that mission. So I was like, um, and in the beginning, I was a roadie. Uh, I was a road racer and a triathlete. This is Southern California in the triathlon heyday. So we're yeah. down on like Solano Beach, Carlsbad, doing all those events down there as a triathlete. Um, matter of fact, uh, I was really good on the bike, so, so elsewhere. So some friends of mine, one was a D1 swimmer and one was a D1 endurance runner. So we were a team and we would win like the state championship, you know, do that thing. So I had that in my past. But basically, um, culturally for me, the road scene didn't fit for me. Those not, those aren't my, I didn't feel like there was more people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like the caustic aspects 
of, 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 of men against men didn't appeal to me. So what I did was I, I stuck with the local jerk type A ride <laughs> until I won the sprint, until I felt like I learned all the things I need to learn from these guys. And then yeah. I never did it again. And I, be, and I focused on mountain biking. And so then you have this thing where I'm becoming a mountain bike racer and I'm having my careers. So I'm working in daily newspapers. I was an informational graphic artist. And, and what's cool about that job, on high, it's, it's all, you know what, on hindsight, John, I'm like a frog looking back at all the lily pads that I've jumped from. Totally. On hindsight, it all makes sense, right? Yep. We have our paths. We don't know it at the time, but we are, we have trajectory. And so now I can see the daily newspaper infographics thing taught me how to take a complicated concept, make it very simple and clear using words and pictures, fast. Every day on deadline, three, four, five of those a day. Dot, 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 dot. It teaches you to think, it teaches you to express yourself succinctly, and at the same time, like because and I've been, I've done all the a lot of endurance racing, you know, like I said, the road, the 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 triathlon, um, cross country racing, but then I stumbled into downhill racing. My first downhill race on a mountain bike was the Kamikaze downhill, the Big Daddy. Yeah. I hit 52 miles an hour on that course that day, and I'll never forget. Like, I had just the day before killed myself for, like, two-thirds back in the sport class endurance. And I was always the guy who could out-sprint pretty much anybody, but my, my climbing wasn't up to task. Yeah. I go out for my first downhill race. I f dude, I finished that race with snot on the entire front surface of my body. <laughs> snot. And, and I was so stoked. I was like, this is it. I'm a downhill racer. And physiologically, I was, like, top ten without trying you know yeah. what I mean so then physiologically and temperamentally I pursued the gravity thing and so check it out I'm going in parallel with my career and while I'm doing infographics full-time plus I wrote for all the magazines you know all the bike magazines yeah. in the day right and I was and I'm starting to have from very early on this 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 kind of pain syndrome in my body pretty bad like I take like 14 ibuprofen a day to get through the day right it was that bad and wow. And now what I understand is it, it came from the diff, the delta between what I intrinsically am and what I need to be doing and what I was trying to be. Yeah. That's what was causing that stress, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, like I said, I topped out in the newspaper pretty young. I had a Pulitzer. I was a manager, and I was being racer boy. So, again, like work guy, racer guy. And I'm like, someday these are coming together. Someday these are coming together. Someday I'm going to write the definitive book. But I wasn't brave enough yet. Actually, what I understand now, this is interesting. At the time, I'm like, I'm a wimp. I can't make a decision. I can't stand up for myself. But un what I really understand is I wasn't ready. Yep. I needed another cycle. So, so then I left the newspaper business and joined the dot-com thing. And remember before Google, the search engine, Alta Vista? Remember them? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was young. You might not yeah. remember <laughs> Well, I before do. <laughs> Google, there was Alta Vista. We were the shit. And, and when I got hired, we were going to go IPO. All the things were going to happen. But they got greedy. They gave it up. Google took over, right? But, but, yeah. but the thing is, like, I'm a worker, right? And I can do any job, right? So I would just do all the work, put my name on everything from the newspaper business. And, and I went through six rounds of layoffs, six rounds of layoffs. And one of my secrets was I used to ride street motorcycles, with the CEO every Friday. And always a little bit slower than him. And I'd always compliment his sick BMW motorcycle. And I'd be like, dude, that corner was amazing while I'm feathering my brakes to not pass him. You know, that didn't yeah. hurt. <laughs> but so, but like, check it out. So it's like, we have career one succeeding on the bike and off. Yeah. Career two. Now I'm a cat one downhill and I'm starting to really win and do well. Yep. And exceeding, succeeding with more digits in my income, right? Yep. And dude, I knew it was wrong. I knew it wasn't what I needed to do. And like I've said the story before, there's this movie, it was called Whale Rider, right? right? And it's about a Maori girl. It's a great movie. Great, great, beautiful movie. It's about a Maori girl whose destiny is to become the king of her patriarchal tribe. It's about her tribulations, this movie. And I'll never forget. I went, I didn't know anything about it except it had won a lot of awards, like Sundance Movie Awards, right? I'm sitting there. At the time, 
I drove a $2,200 Ford Aerostar minivan that consumed equal parts gasoline and motor oil and had probably 30K worth of downhill bikes in the back. You know? That yeah. guy. Like dot com, but you would not know it, right? From the outside. And I'm in that room with a bunch of millionaires, right? And the movie starts, dude. And I'm telling you, it grabbed me. And I just started crying. Like, I, yeah. I, I just had this emotional reaction. And at first, I'm trying to be cool and hold it down. But by halfway through, I couldn't control it. And I decided not to. And I'm openly bawling in this movie. Right? I'm openly yeah. bawling. And, and, and I, I had a vision. And, and these happened for me. Someone, I was a speck. And some, some entity was like, tap, tap. Yo, bro, are you seeing this movie? Yeah. And I was all, yeah. And the voice said, so uh, are you honoring your feet? No, dude, I wasn't. And that was a Friday and I quit Monday. That was the end of my <laughs> dot-com adventure right there. You know? Cool. That's wild. Pretty crazy. So then, um, yeah, it is pretty crazy. Yeah, so I mean. then you did what? And then I was like, <laughs> it's so funny. You think working in a daily newspaper is stressful? think working at a dot com when you're the last man standing stressful my boss was like 12 hours is a minimum day right i sat down to write the definitive book that i've been bragging i would write for 10 years and you open that word doc and that cursor just goes bing <laughs> bing hey mofo what are you made out of right yeah let's see let's see and it was so stressful, John. I got shingles from that experience. Shingles. Wow. Um, once I started the book. But, but what I did, what I did was I went out on the circuit and I did the racing thing. And, and um, I wound up becoming the national downhill champion. And I went to Worlds that year and got eighth. Solid, solid result. And I, yeah, and, I, and I met those dreams. And then that's rad. And then I started the book. And then I started that. And, and like my vision was I could write. And I could do infographics and I could take pictures and I was a mountain biker. So the first book was very much a mountain biker taking his knowledge of mountain biking, doing some research and expressing it as, a, as an information project, the first book. And, and it was um, wildly successful. It's called Mastering Mountain Bike Skills. And um, it was a crazy moment. Um, one of the legends of mountain biking is a guy named Ned Overend. Have you heard that name? Oh, yeah. So he's like, they call him the lung. He's like the grand, dude, he's like 60. He still wins races when he feels like it as a pro. Yeah. And, and it was insane. He ordered five of them from me, five. And I'm like, and he, he put me in the PayPal. He's like one for my son, one for his friend, and, and, and one for me. And I'll never forget the moment when I cracked open a Sharpie and you go, Ned, comma, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> to the legend of the sport. And I signed a book to him, right? It was yeah. amazing, and and that that started this all this off, and by and, and by then I was already running Lee likes bikes the site. I was hand coding HTML, just telling stories, just like yep. hey, here we are at this downhill race. And and one of the things I loved to do is in writing, I would give you the sensation, turn by turn, rock by rock, of riding the trail. So people started following me, and like we got up to about one hundred fifty thousand uniques a month, which at the time was a lot for yeah. a mountain bike niche site, and um. And I, and I finished the book. And, um, and then I was just like, well, every real sport has a curriculum. Skiing, good example, right? Yeah. So I thought, well, I am the guy to make a curriculum for mountain biking. It's perfect. It's an information design project. I want to be clear about this. It was still an information design project. I'm a passionate mountain biker. I live for it. It completely shaped my life. I gave up so Many job offers that people would kill for just because I had to ride a bike. I remember, you want to be the art director at, at, at the NYT, New York Times? Nope, got to bike, ride my bike. It was that kind of freaking vision that I had, that kind of direction. And now I know why, because here we are, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to do this again. So I did it as a pure, dude, I made the most complicated flow diagram you can imagine. It was this big, so you can't see it. Because um, yeah. you can't understand it either, by the way. It was so complicated. But I tried to like, capture all the skills of biking and how they relate and how complicated it is. And, and let's be clear, too. I'm a young man. 
and I'm and I gotta show the world how freaking smart I am. That's what I have to do. So I made it really complicated, and then I started teaching, only to prove it out, only to prove it out. I had no idea I was a teacher. I had no idea I had patience to be a teacher. I had no concept. But John, I started teaching, and it became clear very very quickly that I'm good at it. Yep. That I'm gifted at it. Not good at it, but it's a gift. And and I have this ability that's becoming logarithmically more powerful almost by the day right now because of my spiritual journey that I'm in. I can work with a person. I can I can see people. Yeah. I, I can I can feel you and, and 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 now after 20 years of this, I've personally coached over 10,000 riders like this. Wow. Everybody from I've never ridden a bike before. 10,000, I think I got enough reps to say I have some data, right? I think it counts. Yeah. Everybody from, uh, I, you know, my, my kids ride, I want to ride with them, I have no idea what to do. To Conrad Stoltz, speaking of famous triathletes, yeah. the multiple time Xterra world champion, who admitted to me, you know, man, um, I'm just kind of strong and brave. I don't know how to ride a bike. And I taught him how to ride a bike, right? Yeah. And now he shreds. Or like Leslie Patterson, another world champion, you know? And so, and then, you know, elite people you see on Pink Bike or if you watch Pink Bike, you know, on the World Cup. So it's, yeah. it's the full range. And what's become clear to me is that I'm meant to teach. I am built yeah. to teach. That teaching is the highest use of me because I can use my physicality, my intellect, I can use my emotionality, if that's a word, more and more yeah. to the other stuff that's off, off menu, the spiritual shit, I can connect in that level. And so I've been going and going and going. And so where I used to, no kidding, John, because I was Mr. Smarty Pants, let's not forget how smart I was. And I had, you, people had to know. I had a list of 54 things I would try to teach you in two hours. <laughs> that's not how it works. It was fun, <laughs> and people got something out of it, but that's not how people learn, bro. Now, man. Now? Now? Two? I want to talk about the structure. But when it comes to mountain biking or road riding, gravel riding, more than road riding, there are two fundamental human patterns that we master. Two. One is pedaling. Duh. Yep. And I have developed a method for pedaling that is scientifically proven to be efficient and powerful. I got tested at the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine on a pair of flat pedals, flat pedals. 12 years ago, I'd be better now, and I had the second most efficient stroke they've ever measured to Gunrita Dahl, the Olympic gold medalist for mountain biking. They test everybody in the peloton, so the shit works. So the first goal is learn how to pedal efficiently, and we can talk about that if you like. And the second is pumping. Yeah. Pumping. And when I mean pumping, I'm talking about an elliptical row, anti-row motion. If you watch yeah. like a world-class rider on a pump track, every, their hands and feet are following ellipses in opposite directions. By the way, is the same ex your feet in, 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 a, in, a, in a pump track do exactly the same thing they would do in a mogul field on skis. It is yeah. the same. It's a backward ellipse. Yep. And you're going to love this, John. So imagine that backward ellipse. You've done it, right? Oh, yeah. The hands follow the same ellipse forward. Yeah. It's the sickest, coolest <laughs> thing. And so what we do is I have a method and I invented a machine to teach it. We just teach you this. And not only is it for mountain biking, it's full posterior chain, full anterior chain integrated. So is that your like rep row? Football, kayaking. It's a rep row. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ripro.com. So we, we teach those methods and basically pumping on rollers or rocks is elliptical like this. A bunny hop is the same exact motion without the help of a roller, so it takes more strength. People who can't bunny hop can't bunny hop because they can't pump. If, Makes sense. When you can pump effectively, you feed some more strength in and it becomes a hop. Now, let's imagine a big, beautiful, 10-foot tall sine wave of love roller. I want to get some budget and build heavy equipment and do this. And what you would do, we can talk about the details if you want, is you row through the lip, 
anti-row over the crest and row through the landing to the next one with it's a roller. If we cut the top off and make it a tabletop jump, John, what do you think changes? Nothing. You're in the air. Up one side, down the other, right? Right. Yeah, it's the same exact movement pattern. You could be an inch off the ground or 30 feet off the ground. It's the same movement pattern. It's so dope. Then technical climbing is effectively a row, like going up the face of a jump while you pedal. Yeah. A full out sprint. There's a difference between pedaling hard and sprinting. Pedaling hard is you're sitting down. It's basically hips down. You, you, you pedal hard. Sprint is full body. Sprinting, like a 2,000 watt sprint, which I can touch, that's a row while pedaling. And then, this is dope. We know that we row through holes. A turn is a hole that happens to be sideways. So cornering is the same row, anti-row motion that you do in a straight. It's just sideways like a kayak. No kidding. Yeah. It's just like a kayak. That's it. So I teach two things. Mm. And then everything we want to do on a bike comes from them. And just like any proper martial art, the truth is simple and it takes your whole damn life to master. <laughs> right? yeah, that's no so true, man. That is so true. Um, I, I think that that's fair? a, yeah, it's totally fair. And I love it. I love what you're, what you're saying there. I mean, like I say, we talked before the show and I come from a pretty heavy ski background. There's some fundamentals. And like you say, they're so similar and they, and a lot of them add up and, and make a lot of sense. I think one of the things for, you know, especially our shows is we have, you know, from our company, we've primarily worked with triathletes, road cyclists, and we have a gravel line that's been out for several years. And I think a lot of our listeners here though, are triathlon or triathletes and triath or road re related. So, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is mm -hmm. I know that when I first started riding a road bike, you know, one of the first pieces of advice I had was go out and ride 10,000 miles and come back to me and well, let's talk about it because ultimately what you need to do is you need to get comfortable in a bike. You need to, you need to learn things. So people that are on from a road or tri background, they do have certain skills that are on a bike. What are the, what skills do you say that come from road or triathlon that are good skills that would be applied to something like a, somebody on a gravel bike that's trying to get out and do some more technical terrain? Well, we talked yesterday we decided I'm going to be honest and not kind. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, man, if go. you have a really high quality pedal stroke on your road bike, I'm not talking about you being very light and very powerful. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Of course, your lightness and power, of course. Your mitochondria don't care what bike you're on. They really don't care. Neither do your capillaries. If you have a really nice, yummy pedal stroke on the road, it'll serve you very well on dirt. As a matter of fact, whenever I read about studies of pedaling efficiency, it's always the mountain bikers who are the most efficient, like Gunry Dahl or me, because we are used to delivering power in a variety of surfaces. But right, like if, if, if you learn to pedal well on your road bike, it's a great place to learn to pedal. Yeah. Honestly, what else are you going to do? That applies. And also, too, like your mindset in terms of your ability to do effort, your confidence that you can go, let's say, above threshold for 40 seconds and recover. Like, all that stuff will transfer over. But that's it. And and I'm going to go for it. Like, the more time... and Okay, again, 10,000 riders, roughly. Including a lot of serious road riders. Like, like my, my, my core business, my core business, the people who pay the kind of money I charge, right, are hardcore, lifelong endurance athletes, endurance cyclists who want to yeah. shred who want to ride with alacrity off-road and don't want to get hurt. Or this is very, very, very common. Like, like, like if you take like a strong road ri racer, a really strong one, you can put him on a mountain bike and chances are he, she, they will climb me. Probably. Yeah. You know, maybe. If they're pro, they will. But I'm going to freaking destroy him on the downhill. Like, it won't even be funny. And when their heart rate's 180 still going downhill because they're freaked out, mine's 80. Yeah. You know? And so these people, relative to them, I'm like, I'm, I'm hairy and I'm wearing baggy clothes. They don't get it, right? So, so those people get frustrated and they come to me. So I've made a good living helping endurance athletes understand what it is to, to shred, to find a deep flow state 
to yeah. to use their body and their emotions and their everything in their bike to get in 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 phase with the trail. And I say this to every single one of them. I go, you know, man, you get like a like a Cat One roadie who's put the time in, right? Or like, or even like my friend Alexi Vermillion. He's like a famous road racer who's now an off road racer. I helped him make that transition. He came out with me for a week, right? It's very common, and I always say, you know. Once you learn how to ride, like really ride, like really make sine waves of love on the trail, when you learn that, you know, John, like the feeling of perfect skiing? Yeah. You know that feeling? Yep. Um, if, when you know how to ride a bike for real, every single day is a powder day, dude. You can go to the front of your house in a cul-de-sac and carve corners that feel exactly the same as a perfect groomer. You can go on a pump track and get the same exact sensation as skiing knee deep pow. It's the same mechanics. It's the same thing, yeah. right? So I always tell these people, you know, like once you learn this, you're not going to be a roadie anymore. It's never going to happen. And they always say, well, uh, I'm hardcore. Don't you know that I got five watts per kg? Look at my straw. I'm like, that's great. But dude, without exception, once they learn to shred, they hang their clothes. They hang their sweaty knee guards on their road bike handlebars. That's what the road bike's for. And don't even get me started about how good time trial bars are for, 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 for drying sweaty helmets and things, right? It's, a, yeah. it's really a one-way ticket. And, 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 and really what I'm teaching people to do, we are on a mountain bike. That is, happens to be the vehicle. It could have been a fly rod. It could have been a, a violin. But my instrument is the, is the bike. Yep. It happens to be a bike. But what we do is we develop the absolute core systems of you as a human being that allow you to A, live in a state of, of pretty freaking consistent joy. Okay, yeah. time out, real fast. Going back to when I was a normal civilian. Monday, damn it. <laughs> right? I can't wait to ride with my friends on Saturday. Tuesday, <sighs> Start to imagine the ride. I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. You're at work. This is before the internet, so maybe I'm flipping through like a, a magazine, obsessing about riding. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. And I the only flow experience you have for the whole week is your ride, right? Yep. And you will sacrifice big job promotions in big cities so you can ride. You will absolutely de detonate your important relationships so you can ride. Oh, that's theoretical. I'm not saying that's ever happened to anybody I know. Um, uh, and what you do is you go out with your friends and you have this beautiful flow experience. And it's fun and it's wonderful. And you cling to that and then boom, back to, to work Monday. What I teach people to do, and by the way too, that, that peak experience they had with their, with, uh, with their friends is probably metrics based. How was your ride today? Oh, I beat John in the sprint. Hence, I'm a better person. Hence, I'm happy. How was your ride today? Oh, I PR'd it. How was your ride today? Dude, I hit a normalized power of X watts. You know, or for me, how was your ride today? Dude, I PR'd this downhill on the KOM. It's all metric based, which as we know is fleeting. So you get it. Maybe you crack a beer. If you're a mountain biker, you crack a beer at the trailhead. By the way, before the ride, donuts. After the ride, beer. This is our culture here, <laughs> right? If you're an endurance athlete and you've been doing it well, you'll come in with endurance and you'll hopefully with some good pedaling mechanics that we can use anywhere, right? Yeah. And in my world, right, like, like imagine a triangle or a pyramid, right? And imagine a, a line. This is the top 10%. The bottom is 90%. That's all mindset. Mindset, 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 mindset. And we have tools about that around that that we can talk about. Then, then let's zoom in on the 10% that is mechanics. Zoom out to there, cut it to 90, 10 again. 90% is core human movement patterns. Yeah. Things that every person should do all the time, which in my mind are core engagement, hip mechanics, and being able to breathe with an engaged core. Yeah. Then we get into bike-specific stuff, which would be um, pedaling and pumping. Right. Yeah. And so, so I when, I when I when I work with people like like a lot of us, I've been there. Like cycling, we love to cycle because it's so important to us. It's it's for a lot of us. It's kind of the, the the bright light in a dreary week. Let's be clear. Yeah. A lot of people. That's our. That's how our. I was like that. 
That's how our lives have been structured. You're pretty miserable. You have this incredible flow experience with, with your friends or on your own, and you go back to misery. And then you spend the week like reading about wattage and reading about ketones and ways to get more performance because because not not i know i did look at your feed yeah so <laughs> i'm talking to the right people here and trust me if you want to go metrics dude I, I got my metrics and i'm not ashamed to share them i know about metrics but here's the thing about metrics when you don't have access to your intrinsic joy all you have are metrics yeah wattage body weight mileage that's all you have right and as long as you're chasing that you might go do a 50 mile ride then what i talk to these people i'm gonna go a 75 mile ride really then what 100 and you keep asking then what 200 then what and they start to realize that's a false god I'm chasing. <laughs> yeah. There's totally. no end. And trust me, I've chased that false god. Dude, like I said before, I sacrificed so much to win a freaking national series category one downhill race. I put my life into that. And I gave up my shoulders for it. I'm in the middle of two shoulder replacements right now. See that, that scar? Right? Yeah, man. Like I gave her, dude. And I'll never forget, I won that thing by an embarrassing margin and I did what I set out to do and boy was I sad afterward false gods right false, false gods. gods so but basically this is this is what most of us do in this culture and our minds which are run by the ego are all about metrics and being separate from everybody else now we're getting yep. philosophical but the fact of the matter is if you want to freaking ride your bike as fast and as smooth as you can if all you freaking care about our speed and power if that's all you freaking care about and you just want to destroy fools the secret to that is being a well-rounded joyful person who loves everybody damn it that's how you get fast no <laughs> kidding and it's not woo woo it's not yeah. freaking woo woo and we get stuck in this stuff so what I teach people is like, look, you don't have to memorize 56 things. Yeah. If you're eating the right food and getting the right sleep, your capillaries and mitochondria have a job. They know. Don't sweat it, bro. Or yeah. bruh. Bruh is my gender neutral term for bro, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's freaking work mindset. Let's, let's work movement patterns that help you shovel snow without hurting yourself. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's work these things. And let's work the whole you. And I'm telling, and I got stories upon stories. I'll tell a crazy one. Like, and when we do that, instead of going misery, 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 this ride will make me happy for the following week. If, if A, my normalized power is X, or else I'm a loser. Let's be clear, dude. I've been that guy. And B, I have to beat John at the final sprint or else. And then if you hit yeah. those, then you can have a decent week and then you round it back up. So, so what I, I help people do, it, there's the elegance of this. It's like manipulating the bicycle sort of, you know what it is? We have those like nested pyramids. We yep. could take the bike park out. We do this, I do corporate stuff all the time. We take the bike part out and we go software development. <laughs> we could put a <laughs> trumpet in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. The vast majority of what we should be focusing on is universal humanity. No kidding. What is it to be a spirit in this in this thing? What is that? We're here. Get good at it. If you're going to freaking yeah. do it, be a good human, whatever that means to you. Then we lay the biking on top. And like, like so I'm an open dude. So I've been riding bikes a long freaking time. I've taken it seriously. When I was 35 years old, I was a national downhill champion. And I had yep. most of the KOMs around here around Boulder. And of course, Boulder is one of those KOM communities where a KOM means something, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm 53 today. Last summer, at the age of 52, 52 years old, with no shoulder joints left, but I've been working the spiritual stuff and I went on this crazy two-day assisted journey thing. And I saw 
my version of God. I call it the Holy Oreo, so I don't offend anybody. Um, we did that for two days. I came out to one of my trails. Complete fluidity and suppleness. And I PR'd it. No way. I'm faster today as a 52-year-old man with no shoulder joints than I was as a type A crazy, I got to destroy you asshole at 35. Yeah. I'm faster now. Faster now. Yeah. And, the, and of course, it's partly because I'm not chasing that specific metric anymore. I want to make waves of love. I want to get in tune with myself and the universe. So that's the kind yeah. of thing we do through the bike. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Let me um, let me ask you a couple questions regarding like, you know, I know when you come from a from a tri or road world too, you have a lot of gear that you're kind of familiar with. But as you go over to like mm. gravel, there's some there's some new stuff there. You know, tire pressure becomes very important. Um, other things like that. You're talking about like getting into a flow state, and I get that. But if your you know tire pressure is too high or gear is kind of out of the way, how much does that impact your ability to be in that flow state when you're riding? I believe that your bike has to fit you. It has to. Yeah. It has to. It, it's the tool. It's it's like this. It's like, like we did a joke. We had this uh, channel on YouTube called Joy of Bike. Your yeah. people would enjoy it too. Um, and we did a thing where we were talking about bar width. And it's like, well, Usain Bolt wears a size 13. Shouldn't I? No. <laughs> Of course not. You got to. I'm a size 10 or 9, right? No, your yeah. bike has to fit. And and I'm going to say this. If you want to shred, if you want to corner without thinking you're going to die, if you want to be able to control the bike, your speed effectively, if you want to be able to handle ups and downs and bumps safely, it's you do not want, forgive me, I'm saying this, don't go to a freaking road bike fitter. Don't do it. Don't do it. They don't and why? Know what, what are the how differences between bike for dynamic riding? So what are those differences? Like because, so, like, like you think about I, road, like well, try right. It's all about like being aero and having efficient power and all that sort of stuff. So like, what is the difference for like a, a mountain or a gravel guy? Explain that. I, I will. So so like road try. Well, try is 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 heavy into aero, while yep. trying 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 to find a compromise of pedaling power. And I know that's just. I can't even comprehend. And then road is is arrow two with a compromise. Um, a touring bike is less arrow, more comfort, right? Yeah. And I think from what I've seen on gravel bikes, they're being they're being fit like cyclocross bikes or road bikes. They're being fit the same way, which is you go and you sit on a trainer. There might be lasers or not. And what they do is they try to set you up with normative angles. You have a normative angle of your arm extension, your elbow, your, your, your knee, your hip angle. These are the normative ranges. I paid full money, and I'll say it. I went to retool. I paid all the money because I saw my clients getting these terrible fits, and I had to see what they do. And it, was, it was so egregious, that's when I went public with my fit system. I've been keeping it secret. And they, and they made all these angles, and I go, why these angles? normative ranges that just means we've measured ten thousand people and this is the average that's all that means and then they started moving stuff around on me and i told the guy this hurts my hips hurt i'm a professional and i walked in i said i'm a professional cyclist i'm happy with my four watts per kilogram that's good for me and i got a sprint that's world class i just want to see what we can do and he, and he, and he changed my stuff so much it hurt and he told me trust the fit and, and, and I asked him, I said, how does this position relate to wattage? He had no freaking idea. And if you're a normal person and you pay 400 bucks to a guy who's wearing a freaking white coat, you're going to believe him. Luckily, I don't believe these guys. So the normative ranges based on some pretty old notions about how to make power on a, on a bicycle. In my opinion, being completely stretched out so you can barely reach the bars does not make you a more powerful pedaler. Right. And the only data I've seen actually shows that the more open your hip is, the more glute you get, the more power you have. But traditionally, they set you up for static pedaling based on whatever logic they use. Right. And by the way, the logic over at Retool that I saw. This is funny. The tool is modern. There's lasers and there's a computer. It's very, very impressive, John. 
but the core logic hasn't changed in 50 or 100 years. Yeah. The idea that you should have an eight degree bend in your elbow, et cetera, right? So the core difference is these guys are fitting you for static pedaling. But as you know, bikes should be cornered from time to time. You need to be able to brake sometimes. You got to deal with bumps. And then as you go from like straight road race to touring to gravel to mountain biking, you know, to downhill or motocross, then, yeah. then the need for handling becomes bigger, right? Does that make sense? Totally, 100%. So they don't address how the bike handles. They just don't. It's dynamic. Yeah. And so my system is all about the relationship between your hands and your feet. Because when you're doing anything useful, braking, cornering, going up something very steep, going down something steep, pumping your way through bumps, you're not sitting. So the relationship we care about is between your hands and your feet. Yeah. And that's how that's how we fit bikes. And and I see that's it all the time. It's like it's like if you like I have a, a gravel bike, it's on the trainer right here, right? When I'm in the drops, by the way, if you're on dirt and you want to control the bike, be in the drops. You have a proper hold and the brakes work correctly. When you're on the hoods, this is not good braking power. And by the way, your freaking lizard brain knows how weak this is. Yeah. And it knows that you can't brake hard. It won't let you go fast. It won't. When you dial all the Kung Fu in and you're down in there in the drops, then you can start to really get after it with alacrity. And so check this out. So all good riding happens in the drops. I hear people saying out there, no, I'm not comfortable in the drops. They're too low. Exactly. <laughs> if they're too low, take them off. You gram nerds, you know, <laughs> cut some grams off your bike. I, before people were down with, with, with dropper seat posts, and, yeah. and I used to buy 50 millimeter stems by the case from Race Face. These people come in with 120 stems. I'm like, dude, you need a shorter stem and you need a dropper seat post. So the joke was, I'll tell you what, you give me that 150 stem. I will cut it to 50 millimeters and I'll use the rest of the metal to make you a dropper post so you don't have to have more grams on your bike. You know what I mean? I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. funny, but, but luckily that culture is changing. So, so, so it's like, I get all excited, so I, I got to slow down. It's like th these bikes are just not set up to handle and, and you, 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 you can't do the things you need to do safely. And so everybody I talk to who's riding gravel, who will admit it, will tell you, I feel sketchy in the turns. I feel sketchy out there. It's because the bike's not set up. And then so like again, so this is what I was getting to. The relationship between my feet and my hands. That relationship, I call it the rad, the rider area distance. That relationship in terms of distance and angle. I have a specialized AWOL back there. And is the same on my dirt jump bike. That's what you'd ride like a pump track on or jumps on. Yeah, yeah. My slope style bike, which you ride big jumps on. My, cycle, my, my cross country race bike, we all know what that is. My enduro yeah. bike and my AWOL. When my seat's down and I'm in state, the relationship between my hands and my feet is identical on every bike I ride. So huh. that, 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 depending on the day of the week, it's an adventure bike, it's a gravel bike, it's a cycle cross bike, it's a touring bike, or it's just a freaking bike. But like, when I ride that thing, it rips. And, yeah. and, and I like metrics as much as anyone. So one time, a, a bunch of A cyclocross racers from the region got, got wind that they can learn how to not lose speed in corners. They got wind that you can come out of a corner faster without incurring any risk. People like this. So they come to me. And as a warm-up, I got on my old, I had like a fancy dancy cyclocross race bike at the time. Yeah, Seats up. And so one of my obsessive workouts, because I'm special, is 100 laps on the pump track at Valmont Bike Park on the small one. Just do 100 laps. 10, 10, 10 one way, 10 the other, do 100. Hell of a workout. And um, my best time on that bike in the poster, which is made for that, is 20 minutes. And that's, I've won pump track races. I was third place at the Worlds one time. So I'm pretty good yeah. at pump tracking. I, this blew my mind, John. With the seat up, my cycle cross bike was 21 minutes. Like, when you set them up and know how to ride them, cross gravel bikes are insanely effective 
And I tell you this, brother, if I, got, if I put a dropper post, foreshadow, on my gravel bike, it would be just as fast as that thing. And yeah. I could ride it from home. Pretty, pretty freaking dope. <laughs> yeah, man. Pretty dope. So pretty dope. it's important. And, and, and again, pretty dope. People's, the road community's idea of fit is never, ever, ever going to translate into you. Here's the deal. On your gravel bike, feeling safe. Once you feel safe, you can start to gain some skill. Once you achieve a certain amount of skill and positive confidence, then we can get into flow, right? But to right. answer your question in a very long way, if you don't feel safe because your bike doesn't fit you right, you're never going to get the joy. And all you freaking have is your head unit to see how much power you're making so you can justify yourself. That's all you have. Yeah, we talk about we talk about that quite a bit, especially when you're looking at you know wheel selection and stuff like that for triathletes, because a lot of people get in this mindset that they they want the fastest thing on paper, right? And then what happens is they get out there and they get in some wind, they get uncomfortable, the psychology kicks up, and they end up becoming slower, right? So the same thing mm -hmm. when you're talking about what you're talking about, if you don't feel safe on the bike and you're trying to go into a corner or something like that, and things are getting squirrely on you because you're not fit, right, or you're just not set up properly you're going to lose a ton of time. So like you're saying, I mean, I get it. I hundred percent get what you're saying. Totally. And I agree with you 100%. As far as, you know, so common mistakes. Dude I work. Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. No, I was going to say common mistakes that you would see like well, from people, like what, what would they be? Like when you go from like triathlon and I know we talked before, you said triathletes are some of like the worst offenders, right? When it comes to coming over to something and trying to be more efficient on gravel, what are the common mistakes you see that you just like almost every triathlete that walks in, you're like, okay, that's the triathlete thing that they do. And, and how would you address that? A mindset. Okay. Most of these people have some fear of dirt and honestly, they're not riding their time trial bike. Well, either they're just getting away from, with it because there's traction on the road for the most part, right? Mindset. There, there is a lack of awareness of basic body mechanics for athletic pursuits. And I'm talking about hinging and hip mechanics. Hip mechanics are A1 for everything we do and bikes too. So they're not coming in with a hinge. Maybe their hamstrings aren't mobile enough. Maybe their core is not strong enough. Maybe they just don't know how to hinge. Most people don't, right? And then they don't yeah. understand the core mechanics. It's like, it's like, so, so when I started being a triathlon guy, I grew up in the water as a kid, but I never, I was always squeamish about having my face in the water. Isn't yep. that weird? I hated having the water here. So I hated freestyle swimming. And I was a good in the water, but when I was, I used to do Olympic distance tri triathlons doing a breaststroke the whole way, one half K breaststroke, because yep. I didn't know how to swim. I finally, in college, got a swim coach. Ta-da! I became a solid swimmer. And, and a lot of the, these triathlete people have had swim coaches. A lot of them have had running coaches. They've never had a bike technique coach. Yeah. And for some reason, I think we get distracted by the carbon fiber. They think the machine does it for them. No! I'm, 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 I've become a runner recently. My partner, E, who's here, is an ultra runner, and she's teaching me to run. We just ran before this. Whatever shoes I wear, I still am not that great a runner yet because it's me, bro, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's like like part of the issue is I think a lot of these endurance athletes don't accept that riding a bicycle well is as much of a skill as dialing in your freestyle stroke. Yeah, it is. Totally. And, and and most of them grew up doing swimming drills, and I can remember I remember just like. We're doing this with our finger today. You know those days in the, in the pool? They don't do that on the bike. And, and I got to tell you, like, trust me, like, it's, it's what they're effectively doing is not knowing how to swim freestyle well. And they go out on a gravel ride or even maybe worse, a mountain bike ride with good riders. And they're basically, it's like running into the surf at one of those huge Carlsbad triathlons where people are climbing over you and kicking your face and shit. That's what they're doing to themselves. And you got to be a good swimmer, right? In a pool yeah. <laughs> before you can deal with that running into the ocean, having people walk all over you. Does that make sense? So they skip totally. the whole thing. That's the issue, yeah. the core issue. It's the core issue yeah. of it. And, and also too, 
and 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 dude, like, let me just say this, okay? Like these endurance sports, triathlete, triathlon, maybe the most attract a certain personality type that I, it's part of me. I get it. I get it. That kind of like basically low self-esteem. Let's be honest here. Basically low. But you crush it at work and you have a high FTP. So you have these very selective areas of your life where you feel okay about yourself. I've been here. I get it. By the way, that's fine because it's better than not having any area. If you're a total loser and you feel like crap all the time, it's hard to help you. But if you decide, like, I want to become a cyclist and you start to get become a good cyclist, that's good. Let your ego do that thing. Let your ego be a cyclist. And honestly, it's all about phases and stages. When you're in the stage of, I just got to beat John, do your best to beat John. Do it. Do it. It's part of your growth. Right? It's part of your growth. Yeah. But also understand there are stages and there might be a time when it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of beating John. I'm going to go ride with John and we're going to corner better or whatever it is, you know. And so um, I see this time and time and time again to the point where we can't really get you cornering until you feel good about yourself. We'll get these people. Most of them are C-suite or a surgeon or an attorney, something like that. A lot of these people. And they're heavy-duty, gnarly, endurance people. I get, I get it. But at, at the very belly of the, their, their, their self, they don't feel that good about themselves. And I see it. They'll make a good rep. Like, I've got a system to teach any human being how to shred any bicycle. It's so quick. It's so easy that you're just going to have FOMO for the rest of your life before you met me. You're going to be like, oh, dang it. <laughs> Why, that's why I lost that race. I see it all the time. You know what I mean? But like, yeah. but like, if you have that broken little boy running yourself, you can make a perfect rep. You'll come out of the corner and you'll be hating on yourself. We got to address that stuff. We have to. Yeah. We have to get address that stuff. Then we get can get into get, the bike stuff. Yeah, yeah, let go to get in the flow, you right? Gotta like, yeah. Cool. Totally. And of course, you got to do a certain amount of work. And, and, and real fast, last thing. Yes. Yeah. The person, the archetypal person I'm imagining, the successful person who's an endurance athlete, knows how to systematically gain mastery in something. They become a doctor, they become a lawyer, they become a financier, whatever they do. Shit, the really successful people are badass mechanics with a smog license. They're printing money or a tradesman. But the <laughs> bottom line is these people know how to build the skill. Apply the same mindset to your handling. And my point, this is my other opinion. If you're not willing to learn how to handle your bike safely, consider why and whether you should ride a bike. Yeah, like totally. I am not going to go open water swimming with my shoulders. I'm not going to do it. Not happening. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Like you definitely need to be, you know, play it safe. And, and then that's, it just makes no sense. Um, what would you, what drills would you recommend for somebody that's getting yep. into this that, you know, I know obviously working with you is probably the, the ideal thing or, you know, reading some of your books or something like that. But what would you say like fundamental skills would be or drills that somebody could say, hey, I could go practice this today and just kind of get a feel for it, getting more in that flow state? Great. Great. Number one. OK, first of all, if you're on a gravel bike that doesn't have a dropper seat post. Yeah. OK. It requires and road bikes are the same way. It requires a lot of hamstring mobility to be in a hinge, okay? So yeah. you can have a low hinge. Like imagine, imagine a linebacker about to take off or someone setting up for a classic deadlift. That's a low hinge. And if you have the seat down, you have access to a low hinge. I massively, massively, massively recommend that everybody who rides, who cares about handling and not getting hurt, rides a dropper seat post. Because A, it creates space to, to handle the bike, but B, it opens up your low hinge. Because, so, if your seat's up, all you have is a high hinge. And a high hinge would be analogous to a Romanian deadlift where your legs are almost straight. And anyone who's done this knows how hard that is on your hamstrings, right? Yeah. Imagine we're doing a Romanian deadlift now with your feet offset like they're on pedals. You have to, have to, if you're riding without a seat post, 
you have to develop the mobility and the core strength to maintain a high hinge. Period. 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 And what that means is butt goes back, knees are, o knees are over your heels, your torso is level, and this is critical. There's absolutely, absolutely no weight on your hands. Zero. No weight, no weight, no weight on your hands. Zero. Because look at your bike. The bottom bracket where your pedals attach is just behind the middle of your bike. That's where they put the binding on a ski, is it not, John? It totally is, right in the middle, pretty much. That's it. So, and, and this is important. The two things that send cyclists to the hospitals, well, specifically mountain bikers, but gravel's the same, are A, going over the bars, and B, washing out in turns. Probably for gravel, it's more washing out in turns. Yeah. They are both caused by either being too far forward. If you're too far forward, you'll flop over the bars eventually, or too far back. If you're cornering, the front end washes out. That's what causes it. And if you're on bumps, you get thrown over the bars. So number one, the biggest thing I can tell people, biggest thing I can tell you that's actionable is learn a high hinge. You can use my resources. Learn a high hinge in a bike stance. And when you're coasting along, practice completely weightless hands. One of, the, one of the aphorisms I came out with 20 years ago that I actually still believe, one of the few things I still believe about my, my Kung Fu, heavy feet, light hands. If you are, because remember, when you're standing on your feet, the net force is right in the middle of the bike, just like a ski yeah. dude. There's roughly equal weight on both wheels. So when you corner, the, the, the bike might drift the way a ski or snowboard would, but it won't catastrophically wash out. And when you're in bumps, then it opens up the ability to let the bike do the bump thing while you stay in the middle of the bike. Yeah, so man, that's it. Balance. Number one, learn to yeah. high hinge and keep your hands. It's, it's everything. And what happens is this. like Your lizard brain is a simple thing. It's just like, don't die. That's it. <laughs> don't die. Maybe yeah. make babies. That's all it cares about, right? Yeah. And when you're 16, it's make babies, don't die. It's different. you know. So it's like... When you're off balance, you don't know enough about it to consciously know what's up, but your lizard knows. And it's like, and this is the pattern. So let's say, like, I'm going to say you, John. I'm, let's say yeah, Lee. Sure. Hey, Lee, when, before you knew what you're doing, you're on, a gra you're on a gravel bike. doesn't matter. And you keep getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter tires with less and less air, which is, makes you slower most of the time. But you're trying to create confidence for cornering. So you're, you're, you're using equipment. It's a big part of mountain biking. Dysfunctional part of mountain biking. I come into a corner. I'm instinctively afraid, just like skiing. Okay, I know this one. When someone's afraid of, of skiing, what do they do with their body? Go to the back, man. Get in the back seat. And what happens? You can't turn. <laughs> you can't turn. And then maybe an ACL goes too, right? So it's the same thing. Bad skiing happens in the back, and so does bad riding. So you're going to instinctively lean back. You're going to instinctively grit your teeth. You're instinctively going to grab. These are burned into us as humans. And you're probably going to have some bad thought. This is important. The bad thought's part of the pattern. And you get through the turn without death. You made the worst goal in the world, which is I want to make that section. I want to make that jump. I want to make that. All it means is point A, point B, no death. You have just burned in every single aspect of what you just did, including the bad mindset and the leaning back. Yeah. And it gets burned in. Three or four of those is permanent. And so then it gets worse and worse and worse, and you get people saying, I'm afraid of cornering. You said something about people keep getting bigger and bigger tires with lower and lower pressure. And you're saying that's basically, it's almost like it's like a compromise because they don't have the technique there. So they're trying to get away with some sort of tool as opposed to just having the technique down and being able to corner it on a, a regular tire with adequate air pressure. Right. Right. That's it. And in mountain biking, it's tire size and amount of suspension. I've done it plenty. Trust me, I've yeah. done it. But that's, that's what happens. And so one, one of the things that happens as you start to really understand really how to ride a bike for real. And again, John, like it'd be good to get my mitts on you because once you map riding a bike to skiing, it's 
dude. It's over with. It's game on. Same thing. It's like yeah. so game on. Because then you know how when, it's the same thing. So if you want to make more bite in skis, you load the skis. Do you not? Yep. Like if you want to like get into some hard snow or punch through crust, or maybe you want to just like like hop over something, you load, don't you? Right. Yeah. And that increases edge pressure. Well, dude, I'm giving some good free advice here. Do the same thing on your bike. Traction is not finite. It is not hand down on Mount Olympus, and there's not this traction pie you keep reading about. <laughs> traction is the coefficient of friction between the tire and the ground times downforce. Yeah. Dude, the portable hard pack dirt is your glutes. I carry portable hard pack everywhere. I tell people that's not just for show, baby. That's for go. That whole hunk of meat back there. And so when you corner and you know how to generate traction, yeah. <laughs> you have impunity. You have yeah. confidence. And not only does that lead you to toward flow and actual shred and, and puts you on this virtuous cycle of getting faster, it also gives you the space to l use less tire. I love it. I love it. Tell me a little bit you about use less your... tire because, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell me some of your thoughts on athleticism and how that plays into someone's ability to perform on something like a gravel bike. How important is it? You, you know, man, I'm like a barracuda and you just brought a little shiny thing past me. You know I'm going to strike. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> I'm like, Ow! I know it's a hook, but I got to do it. I can't help myself. <laughs> It's a big deal. The more athletic you are, the more and the more confidently athletic you are, the better everything is. Yeah. A person, and I was that guy, you can be very heavy and very, quote, unathletic with very low self-esteem and very low confidence in yourself as an athlete. And one of the absolute gifts of the bicycle is a bicycle will carry most bodies. Right? Yep. I couldn't run because my feet freaking blew, blew, blew to pieces and my asthma, all this. So you can be on a bike and you can begin to feel like an athlete. And for me, that opened up the whole thing. But, but, but like your ability to do anything dynamic. And, okay, here's the thing. Like one of the things that makes it easy to become a successful road cyclist or endurance athlete is you can just learn a thing, pedal. And yep. over time, you pedal for greater lengths of time with more power. That's fine. But athleticism is really about dealing extemporaneously with what's coming at you. It's the difference between, let's say, when I, I played trumpet for a long time, I was a bugler at a military academy a long time ago, right? So I could learn a piece of music. I can memorize it, I can memorize it, and I could play it. I had skill in that level, in that way. But later on, I took it as an elective in college. And they stuck me because they needed a trumpet in the advanced jazz band where I was expected to play extemporaneously and, and jam. I wasn't good enough. I yeah. didn't have trumpet athleticism. So what I did is I scored my own stuff and made it like I was extemporaneous, but I wasn't until my teacher caught me, right? So it's like, yeah, the more athletic you are, the better all this is going to go. And, 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 and don't, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, but here we go. Going from no athleticism at all, entering on a bicycle or running or, or any endurancey thing will get you in shape. Awesome. Trust me. It's beautiful. You'll see muscles you've never seen before. You look better in your clothes. What will likely happen is the aspects of you that were suppressed will start to come out. I remember when I, be, when I got in shape, I, needed an, I had to get an entirely new friend group. Entirely new friend group. Because all those guys were used to being more badass than I was. And I'll never forget, one time we went mountain biking, and I just, I wasn't trying to, I was just stronger. And I jacked them up. And they started talking some smack on me, and I went back at him. I wasn't going to take it anymore, because the bike made me a confident human being. And I'll never forget, one of the guys goes, you know, I like the old lead better. Done. New friends. So, so th this is a great avenue to find your athleticism but understand this your ability to do this with your feet for hours at a time that's not athleticism that's a specific skill 
athleticism is to have a toolkit that allows you to extemporaneously basically follow the chord changes and play your trumpet with anybody. Or if you're a gravel rider, to take the engine that you've built on the road. Good for you. It's not easy. It takes time. And yeah. have fun. And maybe you get to some gravel, or there's a fun turn, or you want to hop over a rock. That's athleticism. And to answer your question, it's a big deal. And, and, th and this. Some people say, I'm not, real fast, they say I'm not a natural athlete. We can teach it. Everybody's yeah. an athlete. You just have to learn how. Yeah, and that's one of the big reasons like I wanted to have you on the show, right? Because I think most people, you know, obviously gravel's taking off at a at a crazy rate, and a lot of people look at it and think, hey, you know, uh, I've, I'm super strong on the bike. I can do all this stuff. I'm just going to go to gravel. It's going to work out for me. But there are so many skills and fundamental things that you talked about today that, that, that you do need to have, that you mm -hmm. do need to train. Like you're talking about like have a – you have a swim coach or you have a whatever else you need a, you need somebody that can teach you these fundamentals and these core things that are going to help you excel on a gravel bike or something like that. So I think that's, that's awesome. I did want to ask you a little bit about that's some of your own stuff and what you're doing. You know, I've got live instruction, remote coaching, you get a mountain bike school and you've got this rip row thing, man. So tell me all about it. Let's do some little promo on what you got going on here. And if anybody wants to get in touch with you, let us know how to do that. I appreciate that. It's great. So, so first of all, the corporate mission around here is we help you live your most joyful life using a bicycle as the vehicle. That's it. Love it. Right? Um, that's, that's why we're here. And it just happens that when you're more joyful, you're more powerful and fast and faster. It's interesting how this all works. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we support people in a variety of ways. We do live in-person instruction, which is the ultimate, of course. And, and, and in two hours with me, it'll completely change. I, mean, it, it, it's, I hear it all the time. His, this guy, um, this is an old school name, is, is Don Myra from the beginning of mountain biking. And he was one of the guys back in the very beginning, the, the early heyday, there was Tinker Juarez, John Tomac, Ned Overend were the three top three. And you had another guy I don't remember and Don Myra. These were the guys who were battling it out back then. And Don was a stronger was a stronger climber than John Tomac. I did a, a public class like six years ago. He shows up as a civilian. And it's so funny in the beginning of class because we're like, tell us about your riding. And then Lee's like, oh, I just started riding. And Don's like, well, I was a pro. But anyway, at the end of the day, he's like, damn it. If I knew this, I would have been faster than all those guys. Would have It would have made him a million dollars, you know? Um, wow. So, okay. I get excited. It, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And it's so simple. It's so freaking elegant. Elegant and simple and easier are different things. But if you follow the path, it is so good. You, you, you basically will statistically eliminate all common crashes. So we, we, we do this live in person. You can do a private with me or one of my guys, one of my people. We do public classes um, around the country, mostly in Boulder, like to get the cost down. We do remote coaching, which is massively effective. We use Zoom. And now people are used yeah. to using Zoom. And Zoom, for most of you, since you don't live here, is this stuff. You basically, we talk. I send you homework so you can under, understand the cognitive part of it. You get your phone on a tripod. We put earbuds, and I coach you as if I'm there. Those yeah. are massively, massively powerful. And, per, you know, and then we have an online mountain bike school that serves as a textbook and has videos. And we, are, we expect at the end of 2023 to come out with a gravel school with, in it. Cool. But I'm going to tell you this, John. It's all the same lessons but wearing Lycra and having drop bars. Same thing. <laughs> it's the same technique. So if you want to learn how a bike works – pick up any you can do them. that yeah um the elements so, i mean it's it's all the same dude and in yeah. and, and uh um and then we have the rip row and the rip row is a machine i invented actually as my shoulders started to deteriorate right and i was making money i was a coach like i was like the best coach out there but i knew intuitively something was wrong because the way i was destroying my body and I'm one of those special yeah. people, like many of your listeners, who will push through pain, push through pain, way too far. And the Ripro came from my need to understand how the bike actually works, because I had an intuitive sense that I was doing it wrong. And so the Ripro is effectively a, uh, 
It's a rowing machine you stand on. It's two by three feet, ripro.com. You can check them out. And you have to, you, there's optional rockers, so you have to balance, which is a big part of riding, right? And you can practice your rowing motions and your anti-rowing motions. And you learn to integrate your hands and your feet, your whole chain, to pump. So you can practice like the, the motions of a pump track. You can practice the motions of cornering. You can practice the motions of technical climbing in a two by three square foot footprint in your house while you're watching the Tour de France or something. Yeah. And that thing trains the movement patterns. That thing creates the muscle memory that you need to shred, period, period. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, if you go to the gym, you're probably going to do some sort of squat or deadlift. You can do some sort of core. You can do some sort of like anti-rotation exercise and you're going to do a push and a pull. That'd be a five. That's like a full hour workout in a gym. Yeah. The rip row, every rep is all of them. Every, right? So yeah. it's good. And now that I'm on the bike right now because I'm between surgeries, that's like I run and I rip row and it's been amazing. And I'm holding my body it. mass and, and the rip row gets you those glutes that you want and the abs you want. Um, and that teaches it in a very deep way. And, and you can get a thousand reps in one workout. Wow. That's cool. A thousand reps it. in a workout. I'm, 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 and then what happens when, you, when you're on your gravel bike? Here's a classic. You know, some, some places you have to go through like a fence line and they have like a metal grate that's like V, you know, like a, yep. a shape like this. You ever see those? And people yeah. have a hard time with them, don't they? They get stuck yeah. and they fall on the barbed wire and it's, it's, it's awful, right? Or they just walk. Walking's fine, by the way. Next time you get to one, dude, it's a row onto it. An anti row across it and a row back to level, just like you did a thousand times yesterday on your rip row. It becomes subconscious. <laughs> and cornering yeah. is that same motion sideways. So I'm a big fan. And right now, we're right now pivoting. So the original V1, highly machined, fancy dancy, 1600 bucks, dude. And it's like, and we sold a thousand of them. It's great. But it's like, my mission is to help people live joyful lives through the bike. That's what I do. That's why I'm here. I've, I've made all the sacrifices a person needs to make to be here. So I'm the only person in the bike industry that took a $1,600 successful product, redesigned it, and now the new price is $850. Sweet, man. Love it. And we're in production right now. We're in, we're in production right now. The first run's half sold out already. And if people want them, they're awesome. And so, so the new one comes with a flat bar. You can do all the motions for your gravel bike with a flat bar. And then when you're on your gravel bike, you just do this. It's the only yep. difference. And we're working on an upgrade where you can put your own bar and stem on. You can run any bars you want. That's, That's cool, man. Anything but a time trial bar, I think, would be useful. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's, it, it makes the, the patterning, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Now, I've got to ask you this but last this question. This is sort this of funny. So I used to – You go ahead. Okay. I was gonna say I'm gonna, gonna ask gonna you this like, last when question. When I was racing downhill, yeah. So the, the last question that I always ask is, uh, we always ask this what point question, and it's gonna be really interesting to get this answer from you. So generally, we look at this like you know somebody comes on and they're talking about, you know, it could be like a product or something around aerodynamics or it could be whatever, um, and we try to figure out if they have like a 300 watt FTP, and they take the advice of the expert on the show, how many watts are they gonna gain, right? So. I want to ask you this question because we're going to have some gravel cyclists that's on here and they've come from a tri background, you know, average athleticism, but they really have no fundamental understanding of how a bike you're talking about, how it moves and how to, how to actually get in that flow state with the bike. If they go through a course and listen to some of the stuff that they're working, that you're talking about, how much time or wattage do you believe you could add to that FTP over something like a hundred mile race? Okay, I have two areas of answering. Because remember, there are only two skills I teach. Right. Let's talk about pedaling technique. I have numbers, bro. I've seen professionals, multiple professional athletes, when they learn how to pedal the way I teach, they'll spend six months on flat pedals to really learn how to pedal, and then they clip back in. 8% gains in FTP. Those are pros. Wow. 8%. So you're talking about going from 300 to 324. 
a civilian like us, 20 to 30% easy, guaranteed, without your knees or low back hurting or your hands going numb. Yeah, so so now we're talking about 300 to, um, 360, you know, I mean, we're, we're getting up toward a 400 watt FTP now. Yeah. This is the, the number. And for me, when I started this path, here's the deal, I was all about handling, handling, handling. Before I had kids, two days a week on a motocross track, the other eight days a week shredding. That's what I did. But then, you know, we're pregnant and all this is happening. You can't do that anymore. So I went to school on pedaling. And my, my, my sprint is, is <laughs> not normal. But at the time, my FTP was 190. After learning how to pedal, it became 305. Wow. 305. Now, some of that's mitochondria, but most of it's technique. And this is the important thing about it. When you learn how to pedal as a skill, it's not just more effort, more pain equals more speed. When you learn, it's running's like that for me too, swimming. When you learn the skill of it, not only are you lighting more light bulbs in your house, if that's how you power your house, it feels better. It doesn't hurt. And what you're doing is you're getting this amazing virtuous cycle of like, I'm learning a skill. I'm getting better at this skill. Dopamine, 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 you get addicted to it. It's like your cocaine. So that's, that's on the pedaling front. That's very, 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 very easy to quantify. And you can just do the math over 100 miles of pedaling, right? That's yep. easy. The other part's harder to quantify, but I'll say this. Actually, no, I, I can say, oh, okay, here we go. Here's an example. So in Boulder, we have Valmont Bike Park, world-class bike park. Boulder takes their recreation very seriously, several million dollars, free public bike park with staff taking care of it all summer it's it's insane like we take our shit seriously here but it's a big it, it's also designed to be a world cup cyclocross venue matter of fact the people who got it built were mostly the cyclocross people so anyway there's a lot of big cyclocross races there and so i had that group of a class cross racers hire me because they wanted to win this national that was coming through and so there's a section where you're coming down a very fast dirt road. You could easily go 25, 30, just coasting. And then there's a completely flat, open, completely flat gravel turn. So loose, dude. And then the straightaway where, of course, you, that's a good place to put our finish line. Right? Yeah. And so then the finish is determined by the combination of exit speed and sprint power. Right? Okay. So... They really were freaking out about that corner. And you know how it is. You're, you're, you can't see straight in that kind of racing, right? And so we were practicing it. And I was, I was curious to see how they handled it. So often, if I know they're safe, then I'll let them do it. If I don't think you're safe, you don't demonstrate. I teach you, then you demonstrate. But I knew they were safe. So they did it. And I would estimate their exit speed at around 8 miles an hour. And then they would sprint up to 30 by the time they got to the line. I taught him how to pump. So imagine, remember, like, remember a corner is a hole that's sideways. So imagine a perfect berm, like the one I'm in right there. Yeah. That's a sideways row. That's one sideways row. One. Okay. The same principles apply on flat ground. You just create a virtual hole like you would on snow, right? It's the same yeah. thing. And so check this out. You, you, we create traction with downforce from our legs. You can be very, very heavy for a very tiny amount of time or not very heavy for a longer time. And if it's gravel and we were on like what, what would those be like 32 C cyclocross race tires? Yeah. And I think I had mine a 40 front 45 rear with inner tubes. And, and I teach people to scallop turns. So I teach you to do, instead of teaching it as one big 180, you break it into little bites. So you go, you, you, you like you do that little kayak thing. Wah, wah. Well, and on pavement for a 180, I would usually do like three 60 degree turns. Or if I'm going really fast, it might be 630s. Does that make sense? So yeah. I was just, I was like, you guys, I have an idea. I've not done this on the cross bike yet. I, I got to the top of that hill. I let the brakes go. I'm going a good 25 miles an hour. And I, and I took, 
I must have taken tw- 20 little bites out of that turn. I went, no, no, no. But understand, in those heavy moments, the bike's a 1,000 pounds. It's not going to drift. It can't drift. Does that make sense? When it's yeah. on the ground weighing a 1,000 pounds, no danger. When it's off the ground weighing zero, no <laughs> danger. And I go between those two states. It's when you're sitting there weighing 180 hurdle. That's the danger. So bottom line, I came out of that turn at the same speed I entered it. So you asked metrics. You can exit a corner at 25 miles an hour with a smile because you are a freaking badass beast of flow love power and just go half a crank and win the damn thing. Or you can come out at eight deriding yourself for not knowing how to corner and make your 8,000 watts that you you can't make anymore because you're tired. How's that? That's a perfect answer, man. Listen, I really, really, really appreciate you being on the show. This has been like an awesome episode. Love the energy. Love everything you're doing. Uh, I'm going to put all the show notes in here. I'll get somebody, some people checking you out. But thank you so much for being here on the show, man. I really appreciate you. You're very welcome. Take care, man. Later on.